Hi everyone, welcome to the VET Talks. My name is Maria Inês and I recently completed my DVM at Universidade Traz os Montes e Alto Douro in Vila Real, Portugal. I'm as well a former president of the Veterinary Students Association from my university and now I'm currently working as a vet at Clinica Veterinaria do Castelo in Maia, Portugal. So today I'm going to talk about the theme of my thesis and that was potentialities of the use of carbon dioxide laser and diode laser in soft tissue surgery and I choose this theme because surgery is in fact my main area of interest. So I really hope that you enjoy my presentation especially if you like surgery like me and you want to know more about it and how can be the future of surgery in veterinary medicine. So the key points of my presentation are basically the electromagnetic radiation, the laser, laser light, interaction between the laser light and the tissues, the carbon dioxide laser, the diode laser, and the importance of laser surgery in the future. So starting with electromagnetic radiation, we can say that in physics, radiation is defined as the transmission of energy between two distinct points. And in a laser device, and as the name say, laser means light amplification by stimulated emission, the emission of electromagnetic energy in the form of a beam of light is stimulated. So the electromagnetic phenomenon was explained by Faraday and Maxwell, and these two were considered the pioneers of the demonstration of the interaction between an electric field and a mag magnetic field. So a laser device is composed by three main components and they are first of all an energy source and that is what provides the energy for the laser system it can be in the form of electric discharges, flash lamps, light from another laser device and chemical reactions. The second component is the optical resonator that consists in a tube with a medium inside of it enclosed by two mirrors at each side as you can see in the image and one of which is opaque and the other one is partially opaque so the light can go through it and which means as well like I said that is also partially transmissible and the last component is the medium that can be solid liquid liquid crystal or gas and is the medium that determines the wavelength of the radiation and is the medium that also identifies the type of laser device that we are using. So about the laser light, the phenomenon of the amplification of light by simulated emission of electromagnetic radiation was first proposed and explained by Einstein in 1917. And basically, he demonstrated that if an electron already in an excited state crosses a photon with a certain energy, this electron will pass to a lower energy level, thus emitting a photon. And this emitted photon will have the same wavelength and energy of the stimulated, stimulating photon. So this phenomenon basically allows that the light emitted by this type of devices to be collimated, that is that the photons from the laser beam are arranged parallel to each other and 
have equal wavelengths, amplitude, and frequency. Furthermore, the laser light is also monochromatic, which means that the photons that compose the beam have the same wavelength, and also that the laser beam is coherent because all the photons are synchronized in time and space, and these basically are the main differences between a laser light and a white light. Starting now to talk about interaction between the laser light and the tissues, we can say that the beams can have lower or higher density depending on what interaction we want to have with the tissue. So, as you can see in the image, the left beam, this one, has a lower power density which produces a more superficial defect in the tissue. In the other side, the right beam, as you can see, this one has a higher power density, which produces a more profound effect in the tissue. So in a more simplistic way, we can say that a light beam can interact with some material in four different ways. Transmission, absorption, reflection and dispersion. And the, the interaction that we want to produce basically is the absorption, because it's the one that induces biological changes in the tissue, and that is what we want to do with a laser surgery. So the absorption of radiant energy by the tissue chromophores induces biological changes in that tissues like photothermal effect, that is that the laser light is absorbed by the chromophores and then converted into heat. The other effect, effect is the photochemical effect, that is the activation of certain molecules that make part of the target tissue and act like photosensitizers, capturing the energy to the target tissue and not to others. And the last effect is the photomechanical or photoplasmatic effect, that is the vaporization of the tissue himself. And these basically are the changes induced in surgery only, okay? So these are the changes that we want to produce in veterinary surgery. So there are two main types of laser devices used in veterinary surgery. And these are the carbon dioxide laser and the diode laser. So starting with the carbon dioxide laser, the carbon dioxide laser has as main properties a mixture of carbon dioxide, nitrogen and helium in its resonator medium. Its wavelength is 10,600 nanometers, so the radiation is and infrared radiation. This wavelength is well absorbed by water and it can be used in two different modes which are continuous wave or pulsatile. So regarding to the wavelength it's also important to say that once this laser is well absorbed by water, like I said before, its radiation doesn't suffer a big dispersion to the adjacent tissues, so this minimizes the occurrence of thermal damages to dead tissues. And this is why it's the most used laser device in dental surgery, for example. In fact, the energy absorbed by the tissue is quickly converted into heat 
which causes a practically instantaneous eating of intracellular water, which leads to a quickly expansion of the cellular volume and thus to cell lysis. So this process is called vaporization. It can also be used for the hemostasis of blood vessels with a caliber lesser than half of the diameter of the incident radiation beam. And it can also reduce the post-surgical edema because it can seal the lymphatic vessels of the target tissue. It can also seal small nerve endings which leads to a reduction of post-surgical pain and last but not least, this type of lasers can act on fungi, bacteria and viruses, vaporizing them, which can contribute to a sepsis of the surgical field and to a clean wound debridement. So this is a chart where we have a resume of all the main uses of a carbon dioxide laser, which are incision, vaporization, incision in delicate locations, and excision, and also says the best beam diameter, power setting, and power output mode to each uh, use, basically. <clears throat> so this is a good chart to consult when we want to use a carbon dioxide laser and it is also important to say that the device should be kept in a perpendicular position according to the incident tissue in order to maximize the, pot the potentiality of the laser beam so one of the greatest advantages of the use of this type of laser device is that it drastically mani minimizes the tissue manipulation. So as any other device, the carbon dioxide laser has risks associated, which can be mechanical, environmental, microbiological, microbiological or iatrogenic. And these risks can be drastically reduced if the operator knows what he is doing. So if he has information about the, the manipulation of this type of devices, and if everyone that is watching the surgery in the room uh, is aware of the safety rules associated with the manipulation of these devices. So this we should have in consideration these risks, but we should know already that we need to be aware of all the safety rules in order to minimize the accidents. Starting now to talk about the diod laser. So its main properties is that it has a mixture of aluminium, gallium and arsenium in his resonator. It is actually the most efficient device in converting electric energy into optical energy. It, its wavelength is between the 810 to the 980 nanometers, so it is infrared radiation. It is also well absorbed by hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin and melanin and it can be used in two different modes which are free mode that is more used for highly pigmented tissue or highly vascularized tissue and the contact mode for pigmented tissue ideal for incision, excision and ablation. It is also important to refer that during surgery, the carbonized tissue needs to be removed in order to reduce the thermal damage in the adjacent tissues because the carbonized tissue absorbs a lot of thermal energy. So, as we can see in the graphic, we have a lot of components that are absorbed, 
according to the wavelength that we can use. So we can choose the wavelength according to the target tissue and the effect that we want to produce in that tissue. So for example, if we have a diode laser and we want to produce vaporization in the target tissue, the best wavelength to choose is the 980 nanometers because this best is the best one to absorb the water. And in other side, if we want to produce hemostasis, the best uh, wavelength is the 810 and 10 nanometers because it absorbs better the oxyhemoglobin, the hemoglobin and the melanin. So its main uses are basically for simple cutaneous incisions, especially in contact mode, continuous wave with 7 to 9 watts of power, for coagulation as well, because it's well absorbed by hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin, as we saw before, and for pain treatment as well, in a low power density for the treatment of chronic pain. However, this is not really well studied, so we need more studies in order to prove this theory of pain treatment. One of the great advantages of this kind of uh, devices is that we can use it in endoscopic devices because uh, the diode laser is an optical fiber, so it can cross through the channel work of an endoscopic device. As the carbon dioxide laser, the diode laser has as well risks associated and they are basically the same as carbon dioxide laser. Additionally, they have the optical fiber overheating, which can be avoided by the use of fluid or by reducing the exposure time to three seconds per pulse. Uh, because basically the overheating of the optical fiber can damage it and destroy the optical fiber and we can't use it anymore. And the other risk is the evacuation of the smoke that arises from the vaporization of the tissues. So we need to have a good system for evacuation of the smoke during the procedure. So as a conclusion, for me, the importance of laser surgery in the future is that it represents new treatment uh, options for certain pathologies. It can reduce as well the time of the surgery and which is helpful in minimal invasive procedures, especially the diet laser, like I said before, and it can be a, a really good alternative and maybe maybe a replacement in the future for some obsolete surgery techniques and in my opinion it can represent the evolution and the future of some techniques that we have already but it can be another way to do the same thing. These were my references for this work. Thanks for watching my video. I really hope that you enjoy it. If you have any questions, any doubts, you can comment and I will try to answer all your doubts, all your questions. And thank you once again and see you in the next Vet Talk.